so I, I want to uh, follow on. Ingrid was awesome, by the way. Uh, I w if I knew what you were going to talk about, I'd be telling stories as well. But I've got some slides, so, and I can't change on a dime, so I'm going to do my slides. But I have, we have to go to dinner, and I've got some stories that cross over with yours. But I am going to pick up on the, the napkin. And my talk is about what should be on the napkin. What should be on the napkin? Uh, because there's many napkins, and some are more interesting than others. So I've titled this How to Build a Unicorn and Why You Need to Try. And there should be a little bit of irony in that. Uh, just, a, just a little bit. Um, if any of you watch the Silicon Valley show, um, if you're watching it in Iceland, you're probably stealing it, so don't admit to it. Um, uh, but, um, you know, they, they make great fun out of people trying to build unicorns. And it, and it can be funny at times. But there's also some serious stuff. So here's what I want to do. Firstly, I want to talk about the context of building a company. Because companies are built in a context. The 1980s were not the same as the 90s. 1999 was not the same as 2000. I mean, massively different. And uh, 2015 has some very specific elements about it, which it's really important you understand, even before you start writing your napkin. And if you don't understand them, your napkin really won't make sense. So firstly, the context of funding, and what investors are looking for. Then, then I want to talk about, given that context, how should you think about a startup idea? How should you take in what that context is telling you and take an idea and commit it to a napkin uh, in the hope that it could be funded? And I want to tell you about storytelling in that context. Because storytelling is probably the single most important skill any startup founder needs. Because when you start, actually all you have is a story. And unless you can tell it, it won't go well. So I want to talk about that. And there's some tricks. And then I'm going to put myself on the spot. For the last 90 seconds, I'm going to give you my 90-second pitch about a startup I'm involved with to see if I can apply my own logic. So let's do it. So firstly, the context about unicorns. This is just a, a random set. I did a search on Google unicorns funding and picked a random set of headlines that give you a sense of what is happening in the funding world today. Even venture capital firms are being judged by how many unicorns they were in. Uh, and a unicorn, by the way, I'm sure you all know, but just in case anyone doesn't, is a company valued over a billion dollars. And there's now decacorns over $10 billion. This is a Wall Street Journal uh, uh, thing. I think this will play. Let me just try. Yeah, this is going from February 2014 to today, and it's showing the number of unicorns and decacorns in about 15 months, going from 41 to 94. By the way, these are largely private companies valued, but uh, these uh, above a billion, and in some cases above 10 billion dollars, by private investors who are putting money into these companies at huge valuations. So something is happening here, something different, something new. So let's, let's put it in context. How has startup funding changed? And this picture is about Silicon Valley. The numbers would be different, but I guarantee it's very similar here in Iceland. And it breaks the funding environment down into three buckets, or in this case, weights. The first one is startup funding seed capital on the, on, on, on the far, uh, your, your left, my right. There's about $5 billion in Silicon Valley that is dedicated over a three to five year period to do seed funding, about $5 billion. And in that three to five year period, something like 3,000 companies will be funded, something like 3,000. In the middle there, there's about two to $3 billion in companies like True Ventures, or Malik's gonna be here later today from True Ventures, Union Square Ventures, uh, Brad Fells here, he, he, he would certainly do some investing here, although a lot in the first bucket, um, uh, that is dedicated to A, B, and C. Now, obvious point, it's smaller than the first one. There's less money available for the, for the A, the B, and the C than there is for the seed, and less companies get it. About 90% of the companies who get funded in bucket one never make it to bucket two, never. About 90%, it may even be in the high 90s now, as Y Combinator and 500 startups and other incubators enter the scene, the number of companies has grown and the rate of death has got bigger. But if you do make it through, 
and you manage to get traction, there's a huge amount of growth capital available from people like Kleiner Perkins, Sequoia Capital, and others for the winners. Uber, Snapchat, uh, you all know the names. And they can raise billions of dollars as private companies because they have that secret thing, traction. This is uh, from The New Yorker a couple of weeks ago. And um, it's from Mark Andreessen, and it's worth reading. Each year, 3,000 startups approach them with a warm intro from someone they know, and they invest in 15. 15. Of those, at least 10 will fold, so there's five left. Three or four will prosper, and one might become a unicorn. With great luck, once a decade, that unicorn will become a Google or a Facebook or an Uber and return over 1,000x. There are 803 VC firms in the US, and last year they spent $48 billion chasing unicorns. In other words, most investors, when you walk in the room, the first question in their mind is, could this guy be a unicorn? And if the answer is no, that might be the end of the conversation, because that is what they're looking for. It's like a needle in a haystack. This is the 135 seed funds in Silicon Valley today that have at least 50 million, between, between under 100 million to invest. There's 135 of them. That went fast, so you can't read them. 135, under 50 million. That's where the 5 billion comes from. And those guys are typically investing usually under a million dollars, sometimes under 200,000. If it's Y Combinator, it's about 120,000 dollars for about 7 to 10 percent of your company. That's the first stage. Then there's these guys. This is Sequoia Capital Growth Fund. Our growth team invests 10 to 100 million dollars to help companies scale up, build commanding market positions, and realize their highest ambitions. Same thing, Index Ventures last week announced a 760 million dollar fund for growth, for growth. Not for seed, not for venture, but for growth. What growth means is the risk is gone. It shouldn't really be called venture because venture is about taking risk. This is about you know, private equity, putting money into something that's already a winner and turning it into a little bit more money, two, three, maybe up to five times what you invest over some period of time. So this, that is the ecosystem. Now, <coughs> the interesting thing is, even though this may sound appalling and irrational in some ways, from, a, from the point of view of human society and evolution and advancement and science and innovation, it, it is capitalism. And as we know from Michael Douglas, greed is good. And it's rational. This is why it's rational. The world has changed massively. And there are now two billion of us walking around with supercomputers in our pockets who will pay or be advertised to uh, as we use that stuff. And two billion people as a marketplace is huge. And sometimes you can get to a big percentage of that two billion people very, very quickly, in weeks or months, due to the infrastructure that's in place. The app stores, for example. Imagine uh, when we started being able to launch software and within 24 hours it'd be available in over 200 countries to download and install and, and, and buy. It, it wasn't possible. You would have, I remember doing a deal with Compaq to get EasyNet, which was my ISP in 1994, to get the disks on the hard drive. And I think we got to a million people in a year of whom 1% you know, ever opened the, the, the floppy disk. It was very, very hard to get things distributed. Now it's easy. And there's two billion people right there in the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store. So unicorn building is not fictitious. It, it, there is a real basis for why you can build huge companies quickly, if you think in the right way. Uh, this is, uh, again, going back to Mark Andreessen, who is a controversial figure, and this will make him more controversial. Uh, he was uh, talking to uh, Deepak, who was the founder of one of his companies, uh, uh, Doshi, sorry, and he said, mediocre VCs want to see that your company has traction. The top VCs want you to show them you can invest in the future. You can invent the future. In, in other words, don't come in and tell me what your quarterly results were last quarter. 
don't come in and tell me you can do 10% better than that other guy. That's traction. Don't come in and tell me you got a million downloads. Show me how you can make the future different. Then I'm listening. So, um, you know, most VCs are what these guys call mediocre. The word traction is the first word out of their mouth. For those of you who are founders, the next time a VC asks you, what is your traction, show them this slide and say, I'm not sure I want you to invest in my company. You don't seem to be thinking big enough. So given that backdrop, how should we be thinking about startup ideas? So this, is, this slide you can take with you for the rest of your life. The first thing you have to do is think historically. What does that mean? Don't think in a constant way or a static way. Think about the past, the present, and future as being in movement, in change. And where you want to be playing, oop, let me go back. Where you want to be playing is here, on that overlap between now and the future. So if your idea is to build a social network on the web for people to interact with each other, past, past, not future, not present, even past. If your idea is to build a search engine, past. People don't use search that much on mobile. They use apps, not web browsers. So if your idea is to build a website even, past. Not present, not future. You've got to be thinking about not just the present, but the near future, where that line overlaps with the, with the future. And your idea on your napkin, unless you can very confidently say, it doesn't exist today, but it will in the future, and believe that, it's probably the wrong idea. And confidence, by the way, comes from that. Confidence is not only a subjective thing, it's from actually believing in something. And if you believe in it, you will probably be confident, even when you get beaten up, as long as you believe in it. So in that little oval shape, there are only two things. If you were to reduce the world down to the atomic level, there's only two things. I call this the living dead. There's the living dead. I call it the living dead because of AOL. AOL really is dead, but it's living. Um, a lot of things are the living dead. In order to qualify for being the living dead, you shouldn't have much of a future, but you probably still survive. Um, we'd all have different debates about who should be in there, but I personally put Google in there and Facebook in there, which uh, up until two years ago. Facebook were definitely in there, but then they bought WhatsApp, and then they bought Instagram, and suddenly they're not in there anymore because they've changed themselves. Uh, Microsoft definitely was in there. The new CEO is doing some interesting things. They might be able to get out of there, but uh, hence this is not static. It changes depending on what people do, but you can pretty much say something is the living dead. And if it's the living dead, you don't want to replicate it. You don't want to become the next version of it. Just don't go there. The second thing that exists in that oval is the unborn. And the unborn, of course, is still alive. It's there. There's a heartbeat. But it, no one knows about it yet. No one can see it. That really is the future. The future is those things that have a heartbeat but uh, do not yet exist. And the best test is that when you explain it to somebody, they don't get it. <laughs> if they get it, it's probably too late. You should be a little bit weird because you're describing something that you can see and no one else can. And if you're not describing something that you can see and no one else can, if everyone else can see it, it's too late. It really is too late. So, choose a big idea that accelerates the death of the old and the birth of the new. All those words are important. Big, idea, it's not a business yet. It's big, it's an idea. It accelerates the death of the old, so you're going to disrupt something. And it accelerates the birth of the new, which doesn't yet exist. So now let's talk about storytelling. So you've all got your idea. You put it on a napkin. You may have built a prototype. You've actually done something. How to talk about it? Well, I think this is a useful way to think. Think about 
if I was a publisher and you were coming to me asking me to publish your book, what would you need to have done before you walk in the room? And I, I, this is not very interactive, so I'm not going to wait for the answer. I'll tell you what you need to have done. You need to firstly, you, I've written two books, so I, <coughs> I know this, but it's logical and obvious, and anyone knows this whether you've written a book or not. The first thing you need to do is, what is the book about? And that is not the same thing as the first chapter. It's the plot, the beginning, and the ending. You need all those, the beginning, the ending, and the plot. And unless you have all of them, the publisher can't really get their head around what your book is. So you have to have all of them. They want you to have the first chapter to prove you can write, and that when you write, it's interesting. So they want to, you, you have to have done something. But that wouldn't be enough, because unless they know the plot and the ending, they don't know if the book really is going to grip anybody. They just know you can write. So when you tell the story, you have to do it the other way around. You have to start with the ending and the plot. Because if you start with the ending and the plot, you give the publisher a context. And only then is it relevant how your first chapter reads. Reed Hastings, the Netflix founder, did exactly this. Reed actually started with a spreadsheet. And the spreadsheet had a line at the very top, how many people are there in the world? And the second line was, how does that break down into countries? And then the third line was, how many have a DVD player in their home and will have? Then the next line was, how many would rather rent a DVD than own a DVD? And then the final line was, how many of those would like to have uh, no late fees and have the DVD come in the mail as opposed to going out to Blockbuster to get it? And that spreadsheet showed that he had a multi-billion dollar business. And it was only a spreadsheet. It was an idea. Now, in, in his house, he had a room filled with shelves with two ladies stuffing envelopes. And after the investors had seen the spreadsheet and got really excited because, never forget this, investors want you to appeal to their greed. Not in the negative sense of greed, the possibility that they might make lots of money. They want someone to walk in the room and just blow them away. It would make their day. It's like the music guy who sees a band and listens to a song for the first time and knows they're going to be stars and no one else knows about them. That is the dream of the investor. They don't want the guy to come in and show that he's been really prudent, saving nickels and dimes, hasn't been spending too much, and you know, has a great business that today does a million dollars a year and next year will do three. That's not what they're looking for. Not interesting to, the, to, to these investors. So you really have to uh, uh, you know, get them to feel greedy. And what Reed did is he then took them into the back room and showed them the lady stuff in the envelopes. And immediately they put that in a context. Not only has this guy got a big idea, he's actually executing it and people are already getting the DVDs. And these two ladies in this back room look larger than life. If he'd have taken them there first, the guys would have said, well, this isn't interesting. So you have to put your operational excellence, your day-to-day -day execution, your prototype, into that context. And if you don't, you're shooting yourself in the foot because you're making people bored, not excited. Even if you're excellent at operations, it doesn't feel big enough. So, now I'm going to put myself on the spot. How long have I taken already? 15 minutes. Okay, this is my last 90 seconds. I run an incubator called Archimedes Labs. We do uh, investments in companies, accelerations, but we also invent ideas ourselves. Those are called incubations, whereas the investments are called accelerations. And this is one of our incubations. It's my idea, so I'm in love with it. It's called Chat Center. And I'm going to try to do what I just said needs to be done in the next roughly 90 seconds. So here we go, Chat Center. Mobile has changed the world. There are a billion websites but there are over two billion small business owners who are on smartphones. Consumers discover those businesses on the web, but the owner of the business is walking around doing their job with a smartphone in their pocket. 
which has led to a problem. How can a web visitor connect to a mobile business owner? You go to the website, you actually want to interact with the person, but there's no one there, it's just a website. We have a simple idea that is very powerful. In fact, it's so powerful, I guarantee by the time I've finished, 90 seconds from now, anyone in this room with a website will want to become my customer. It makes you reachable on any device, anywhere, at any time. It's a simple, universal chat address. What does that mean? A universal chat address is a chat address for your phone where the sender doesn't need to do anything. Doesn't install software, doesn't have to do anything. But if they, if they know your chat address, just like if they know your, your phone number, they can ring you. If they know your email address, they can email you. If they know your chat address, they'll be able to chat with you. And you'll receive that customer's communication on your smartphone. It looks like this. Yes, it's a URL. It can look like this too, if it uses your domain name. A URL. Now, it doesn't seem very dramatic, does it? But imagine what URLs did for pages. Before there were URLs, pages were separate from each other, not connected, not related, not visitable. Well, what if the URL was for people and businesses too, on their smartphones? What if every person could be connected to through a click or a tap? What if every business could be communicated with through a click or a tap? This business owner sitting and having a coffee would be able to be connected to from her Twitter page, from her website, from her LinkedIn or from her Facebook with a single click and the person doing the click would ha not have to stall anything in order for them to chat with her on her smartphone. That's what URLs did for link pages and that's what it can do for people. So names become links. And guess what? Everyone has a name. People and businesses. We've built this SaaS-based cloud system that supports chat as a bridge between the web and mobile, or you could say C to B, consumer to business, in three flavors. If you buy the service, you can have a button, click to chat, a simple URL which can go anywhere, or a widget that pops up in your website so that the person on the website can chat with you through the widget. It works on the web to mobile. It works from social media to mobile. It works from app to app, where the, uh, the app developer wants to build this in for its users. It works from email to mobile, either in your signature or in email campaigns. And it works mobile to mobile. It's got a simple user interface, just like iMessage, or iWatch, Apple's watch. And it's $3.99 a month, $3.99 a month. Now, we asked the question, how big could this be? And we note that there are 970 million or so websites out there and 270 million people who already pay for their name, domain name in this case. So we made Chat Center work with domain names and appeal to people who already own their names, just to extend it so that the name can do email already, it can do website already, now it can do mobile chat too, same domain name. We emailed 16,000 of these people just to test if they would buy, and one in a thousand did. And we're sitting on 270 million of these email addresses, which means that our first year revenue, if we just were to connect to 100 million of them, would be about three and a half million dollars, first year revenue. I've done many startups. The biggest first year revenue I've ever seen is under half a million dollars, so this would be huge. We're about a year and a half into this, and we're looking to raise one to two million dollars. And if you give us that money, you'll own about 20% of the company. You'll go into this table as a 20% owner. Thank you, and uh, come with your checks afterwards. So that's my pitch. That's my pitch.